So it's my pleasure to introduce someone quite familiar to the CSAIL community. This is Professor Bill Freeman. He is officially... Oh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Freeman. He is the uh, Thomas and Gerd Perkins Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science here at MIT, and he's a member of the CSAIL lab. His current research interests include vision, mid-level vision, and computational photography. Um, but in the past, he has also looked at, I think, something I remember, steerable filters and pyramids, orientation histograms, viewpoint assumptions, um, and is the um, recipient of multiple outstanding paper awards in computer vision, um, test of time uh, recognition also um, at different conferences. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the IEEE, ACM, and the AAAI. Um, and in 2019, he was given the highest award in computer vision, which is the PAMI Distinguished Research Award. So over to you. Uh. Uh, thanks so much. So first, let me check the audio. Can you hear me in the back? OK, great, thanks. Um, so I've been just having a great time today. And thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Una May. Thank you, Laura Lynn. Everyone who worked together to make this set of speakers come together. It's also terrifying to speak after the other speakers. It's, wow. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, now, different than the other talks, I want to give a kind of a case study of um, so in CSAIL, we're encouraged to, to pursue our dreams, to follow those crazy ideas, as we've heard all day. And so rather than kind of talk historically, I just want to give one case study of one example uh, of me and my lab aspiring to do that. And so this and, and uh, where that, what that led to. So this is about the moon camera and the corner camera. OK, so 15 years ago, no, there's, now there's two cables coming out of it instead of just one. <laughs> but OK. Um, so 15 years ago, I had a sabbatical. And I spent most of the sabbatical looking at different objects in the world and asking, can I make a camera out of that? Can I make a camera out of that? Can I make a camera out of that? And I looked up at the moon and asked, can we make a camera out of that? And, and somehow this idea just stuck with me. It kind of infected me like a virus, if you will. And I've been working on it really ever since. I've been working on other things too, don't worry, but I've been working on this one. And um, so let me tell you about it. Here's the idea. So uh, there's the sun shining on the Earth. The, the light from the Earth reflects to the moon and illuminates what uh, the part, that darker part of the moon that in a crescent moon uh, is not illuminated by the sun, but it's, what's it illuminated by? It's illuminated by the Earth. And, um, I've just been taken with, that, with this idea. Is there some way that we could look at the Earth, or look at the moon from Earth-based telescopes, do some sort of computation, and compute an image of what the Earth looks like from space, from the moon? Now, let me be the first to point out here that there's no scientific reason to want to do this, OK? <laughs> Uh, we have satellites. They take great pictures of the Earth from space. We don't need to do that. Uh, so, well, why, why do it then? Well, there are kind of two reasons. One is kind of the, well, the poetry of it. Just, it would just be so lovely to take a photograph of the Earth from space with ground-based equipment, um, seeing the Earth in the moon, just lovely. But perhaps more important, there's a science outreach reason to do it, which is that we would love to make it possible for amateur astronomers, high school students, astrophotographers, to go into their backyard, set up their telescope, look at the moon, and compute a picture of the Earth. That would be just great. It would be uh, uh, introducing a new planet for amateur astronomers to photograph. Um, it, it would be, uh, I think it would help encourage interest in ecology and weather and uh, Earth studies. It, it would be lovely, I think. So that's the motivation. Um, now, spoiler alert, I haven't done it, OK? <laughs> haven't gotten it to work. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it now. But what I want to do is tell you one of my favorite approaches to it. And these different approaches have, have led to really fun spin-offs. Uh, and so I want to just tell you one example of my favorite approach and a spin-off that it led to. OK, the, this, the approach is uh, what I call Crater Cam. And I have a little demo to show you. OK, 
So we're going to use craters at the edge of the moon, like those you see there. So here is uh, two walls of the crater. This is like the front. There's a circle of the crater here. This is the front wall, Earth-facing wall. And this is the back wall, the one that's further away from the Earth on the moon. Here is our little proxy for the Earth uh, reflecting sunlight out in space. Now, we're going to look at cast shadows of Earth's shine on the back wall of the crater. So is this going to work? Let's see. So let's say red's on top. So um, can you see the, the cast shadow of this Earth shine? Can you see it in the back? Did anyone raise a hand? OK, great. Thank you. Now, it turns out that if we measure that fuzzy cast shadow boundary from the Earth, we can compute an image of the Earth from space. Now, to persuade you and to let you know how that's true, let's, um, let's all imagine ourselves on the back wall of the crater looking back at the Earth. What's it going to look like? So when you're deep in the crater, you're just going to see a little bit of the Earth peeking up over that front wall of the crater. And then as you climb further up on the back wall of the crater, you'll see more of the Earth peeking up, and then more, and then more. So at any point on the back wall, you basically get an integral of all the light from the Earth that's peeking up above the front wall of the crater. And so you could imagine that you could subtract the brightness that you see at one point in the fuzzy shadow from the amount you see just above it, and you would get the average of this little horizontal slice of the intensity of the Earth. And if you do that for all positions, you could get this kind of horizontal uh, image of the Earth that you're measuring vertically and you're averaging horizontally. So that's a 1D picture of the Earth. And then if you do that same thing for many different craters at different orientations, you could pull out a full 2D picture of the Earth from space. OK, we're there. <laughs> OK, but there's this bug. And that is let's, it's scale. So to scale, if the Earth is the size of a quarter, and of course I couldn't find a quarter in my backpack, in my office, I couldn't find one anywhere. But, but anyway, you all know, remember what a quarter was like, OK? <laughs> so I have a quarter here, and if you have a P holding your hand there, that's to scale the Earth and the moon. So if you're sitting there on the Earth looking at the moon, looking at that, that crater boundary, it's a really small, fine resolution thing. And it's really, uh, the measurement would have to be more than what an amateur photographer could do, an amateur astronomer could do. So let me, uh, I've simulated, uh, so I've simulated it. I'll show you that in a second. These are um, the explanations that go along with what I just showed you in the demonstration. And here's the simulation. So at the far left is a satellite picture of the Earth. The middle column, middle of the row, shows I, I got to say, a really optimistic, extremely talented amateur astronomer could pull out, using the method I just told you about, an image of the Earth that looked about like that, roughly two by two pixels resolution. Okay? And if we allowed ourselves to go write a grant, get time on a professional telescope, and do this technique with a professional telescope, we could probably get the image on the right. But of course, there's no need to, because we already have high resolution images of the Earth in space. <laughs> So, uh, but what's really cool, and here we have this little plug for curiosity-driven curiosity scientific research, is this little configuration with a small tweak uh, gives you something um, that lets us use it on down on the Earth. And let me show you that manipulation. Here, here's the big reveal, OK? This is, remember, this optical elements are here. This is the front wall of the crater, the back wall we project onto this. If we Take this out here and move it like this and put it here. Um, so now we have this vertical edge. Again, same optical elements as we had before, a vertical edge of uh, flat projection plane. But what is this? This is the corner of a building and the ground. This is a tree and the ground around the building. This configuration is everywhere around us. And the, the imaging works just in the same way, slightly different, slightly different geometry, but it's really the same story. And we call this the corner camera. Uh, and it came from trying to solve this problem with the moon. Now, so here's an example where you might want to use the corner camera. Now, there are three main differences of this terrestrial corner camera from the crater camera that we talked about before. The first is 
finally we have enough resolution. You're gonna be uh, looking at this thing here, you'd be looking at the uh, common region that the person around the corner and you can see. Um, and by the way, so with the moon camera, we, with the crater camera, we use it to see the Earth. Here we're gonna use it to see around the corner, but it's the same technology. Um, okay, we don't need to worry about, worry about resolution. The other two differences are both in the other direction. They make things harder. One of them is that, uh, as you recall, with a single crater, we just get a 1D image. And again, that's gonna be the case here. Uh, we really don't any, get any uh, differentiation of light coming from different parts of this vertical edge here. And so we'll just make measurements in angle this way horizontally, but we won't be able to see any differences vertically, just as with a single crater, we can only get a 1D slice of the Earth out. So that we'll get a 1D image out, but still that's gonna be useful. Then the second one is really much more interesting. And that is with the crater camera, we had, we were looking at this bright thing that's just out there in space, nothing else around. And so any light that falls on the, the uh, shaded side of the moon comes from the Earth. But with this corner camera on the ground, terrestrially, we have light from all sorts of places falling on this thing. And, uh, and then we wanna find out what the difference is by something else behind the corner there. So just to, just to drive that point home, I've asked a volunteer in the front row to help me. Now, okay, first, just a second, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> I want you to first look at how much light is falling on this projection plane, on the ground plane, and remember how bright that is, okay? Now, Rod Brooks, if you could please stand up. Now, he's changing how much light is falling here, just a little bit, okay? Notice the change? No, you don't. <laughs> Okay, you can sit down now. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Um, so we've done uh, sort of theoretical study and we've also made measurements. And the, the magnet, so it depends on the details, what the contrast of Rod was from the background, how big he is, how close he is. But in the ballpark, it's a one part in a thousand difference that is caused when the person behind the corner moves around than when they weren't there. What it causes on the brightness that you'll measure here. Now, one part in a thousand is really a fascinating, uh, kind of a lovely brightness change. It's invisible to our eyes, okay? We just can't see it. But it's measurable with a conventional camera by averaging over the right pixels. So it's like there's this, these gremlins, these fairies, these, this signal that's everywhere. Every corner you see has these one part in a thousand changes that are telling you what's around the corner, but you can't see them, but you can measure them with your camera. That's just, I just love that. Um, and so, so let's show an example uh, of this in action. So here's, uh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, here's the ground outside. And I gotta tell you, this is, you know, daylight, outdoor, non-laboratory conditions. Um, there, so there's our camera looking at the ground and people are gonna move around the corner, not visible from the camera. And all that's visible, you, we, you know, both the people around the corner and the camera can see the, the common area on the ground there um, in front of the corner, but they can't see each other. And uh, so here's Katie Bauman, uh, you know, in addition to doing the Event Horizon Telescope work for her thesis, she also did this for part of her thesis. Um, so she and undergraduate uh, Vicki Yi are, uh, worked on this. I, um, and so there they are, moving around the corner, not visible to the camera. And here we have what the camera took, which I think of as the world's most boring video. <laughs> okay, it's playing now. I, I don't know, can, can you, can, can you play the audio just to just let them hear it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, you hear traffic sound in the background because this is videos playing. And there are all these invisible one part in a thousand brightness changes occurring. And we can pull them out from this video, though. How do you pull it out? Well, you multiply, you, again, with the crater cam, we differentiate it vertically. Here we're gonna differentiate in these pie-shaped wedges. So uh, the part of this that's dark, we multiply by negative numbers. You know, yellow, we multiply by positive numbers, add them all together. So these are, the, these, are these pie-shaped wedges that we average over on the ground. And here's the result. 
So, so it's a, remember, it's a 1D video. So how do you display a 1D video? Well, we got angle uh, there on the top, and we have time vertically. And because it's 1D, it's just a single number rather than uh, depending on two, two variables. So we're averaging vertically and we're measuring horizontally. And there's your 1D video of what's around the corner based on that world's most boring video that you saw. And despite being a 1D video, it tells you all sorts of useful information about what's around the corner. It tells you how many people there are. It tells you how they're moving. It tells you whether they're moving further close to the corner or further away from it. All sorts of things that are very useful for us as citizens walking around uh, in the world. It's just useful for personal safety to know what's around the corner. It's also maybe useful for automobile safety to know what's around the corner. If you had a car that could go look at these measurements on the ground, um, maybe it could tell you in advance that, oh, there's a child running toward the corner and automatically slow your car down, even though neither you nor the camera can see what's around the corner. So to test this, just an initial feasibility study, we borrowed a child. <laughs> um, sorry, I forgot to say, you can, this, this is two people, here's one person. Okay, now the child part. Uh, we borrowed a child and had them walk around the corner. Uh, so, so, okay, we're in the, in the dark part there uh, with our camera looking at the ground. The child's moving around in a circle. The bottom left shows that most boring video. And the strip on the right tells you the reconstruction, which says, yes, indeed, even though the child is smaller and closer to the ground than Rod, uh, we can still pick up these otherwise invisible shadows of the child around the corner. And so, you know, potentially this could be used to help identify any cases where a pedestrian or child, anyone was running toward the corner and, and automatically slow your car down. So what a nice journey, you know, plus one for curiosity-driven scientific research that this crazy, very whimsical project of pulling out an image of the Earth from looking at the moon uh, leads to something that may possibly help your car stop to avoid hitting a child. Um, happy birthday, C-Sale, and thank you very much. These are my collaborators. <laughs>